It is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, uh, Professor David uh, Waddles uh, of Purdue University. Um, Dr. Waddles received his BS and DVM degrees from Cornell University and his PhD degree from the University of Minnesota. Until 2014, he served as Professor of Comparative Oncology and Associate Director of the Center on Aging and the Life Course at Purdue University. Currently, Dr. Waters is Director of the Center for Exceptional Longevity Studies at the Gerald P. Murphy Cancer, Cancer Foundation. Appointed to the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Keck Futures in Initiative Scientific Panel on Extending Human Health Span in 2007. He is nationally recognized for his work on utilizing pet dogs as models of human aging. He is a fellow in the Biology of Aging, Gerontological Society of America. Dr. Waters is also an expert on the comparative aspects of prostate cancer in men and dogs. His research at the Murphy Cancer Foundation, which targets the underexplored intersection of the fields of aging and cancer, is aimed at developing personalized interventions that promote successful aging and cancer avoidance. As a teacher, Dr. Waters contributes significantly to Purdue University's dual title PhD program in gerontology for more than a decade. His course, To See and to Seize Opportunities, offered interdisciplinary graduate students the opportunity to explore the skills and attitudes that promote self-renewal and peak performance in discovering and educating. In 2005, he was awarded the Great Teacher Award for Exemplary Interdisciplinary Teaching at Purdue. In 2010, his first cross-country scientific expedition to study the oldest living pet dogs in their homes as models of highly successful human aging, the Old Gray Muzzle Tour, was featured in USA Today, AARP Bulletin, and Good Morning America. His TEDx talk, The Oldest Dogs as Our Greatest Teachers, Get the Words Out of Your Eyes, underscores how language limits the scientific method. Dr. Warner's talk today is The Art of All the Art of Possibility, Philosophy, Linguistic Readiness, and the Attitudes of Science. I want you to welcome Dr. Warner's. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Is, can we turn that microphone off? Maybe not. Can, I, can everybody hear me okay? It seems to be echoing up here, but it's okay. All right. Well, thanks first to Najib for the kind invitation to participate in the conference and Grandin uh, for the introduction. Uh, what I'd like to uh, hope that we will do in the next 35 minutes is turn our attention to uh, the art of possibility, the art of exercising. Um, our greatest potential, what, what might we do to achieve our greatest potential? Um, let us say that our goal is to cultivate tomorrow's imaginal analytical leaders, not just trained in analytical reasoning, but also steeped in imagination. It sounds simple enough, but there's going to be many obstacles. We might say that we're striving for situational excellence, right? Not just generalized excellence, but excellence in particular situations and varied situations. But our greatness will hinge upon our failures. And our willingness and our ability to fail will actually determine in important ways whether we achieve greatness. We should be striving then for what might be called an inner eloquence, right? And that's the language we use inside our heads to develop our ideas and try to make sense of the world. Yet, our language, our categories, are going to limit the scientific method we use to try to make sense of the world. We we'll see, and we we'll seek to see and report our discoveries, but we have to realize that what we're seeing, our perception, 
is theory laden. Stated differently, it's our concepts that create our observation vocabulary, that is, the suppositions and preconceived notions, the lens through which we encounter every experience, the way we experience nature, the way we experience other, as Dr. Horn taught us yesterday. And unfortunately, indoctrinated concepts are too often going to be our starting points. So it's not going to position us very well to take imaginative leaps and to leap away from dogmatic stances. So amidst the obstacles, we have to take responsibility for our performance, the quality of our performance. And so optimizing your sensitivity to circumstances your response to challenge is going to be your responsibility. So question, which area then, which disciplines might provide the best training for us to have a clear advantage of reaching our full potential? And some insights from that comes from a book written back in the 1970s by a philosopher, Philip Phoenix, called Realms of Meaning. And he tackles this question. He looks at the various domains of thought and endeavor, like art, history, theology, science, and asks the question that I thought the analysis was, was quite uh, revealing to me. What do we call the area of study that focuses on what is? What do we call that area of study? All of us have our own disciplines, right? We, we hope this is our discipline, right? Phoenix says that's history. That's the what was, right? And that's the closest thing we have to what is. So historians, OK? Then the question is, what is the domain that focuses on what is ideal? And that's religion. And then finally, what's the domain that focuses on what is possible? And that's philosophy. That's philosophy. So if we turn our attention, this, this creates an interesting and intriguing target, doesn't it? Because perhaps each one of us can become a so-called doctor of philosophy. Uh, that, and because philosophy is the discipline, which is the pursuit of possibilities. So then how should we prepare ourselves to master the art of possibility? I like the quote here by uh, the excerpt from Armando Bensavenga. Um, Let us have a few individuals trained for what is not at hand, and perhaps never will be at hand, but could be at hand. A small group of revolutionaries will have to be slowly and patiently trained to undo all training, to practice taking practices apart, to tell and write what now cannot even be imagined, and thus draw anew the confines of imagination. So we, we need vagrancy in education. So where should we turn to find out the things that will put us on the road to possibility? Um, I turned to K through 12 science education. That makes sense to me. And while leafing through this book, Developing Children's Thinking Through Science, which was published more than 40 years ago, I came across an interesting list. Eight attitudes that science education should instill in students. When I think back of my junior high school and high school education, I didn't realize the teachers were trying to instill attitudes in me. It seemed like they were trying to pour facts into my head. Um, this, is, this is an interesting list, right? And, and I buy into it completely that, that attitudes are really uh, under, under recognized uh, in, in terms of what we should be doing to get toward that art of possibility. And take a look at this list. The attitudes of curiosity, rationality, objectivity, suspended judgment, critical mindedness, open mindedness, honesty, and humility. That's the eight. Yes? I just have a quick question. Which is the ideal? You said this was 1970. 1970. All right, so how, and I know it's off topic, and I do apologize, but I just want to make sure that I'm not 
So ask me afterwards. Okay? I'm going to revise this list. Okay? All right, so I think this is a good start, but what I want to do is I think we should revise one and add two. And the one that I'd like to revise is this one. And I think at the very least it should read this way, that the attitudes of science that we instill in young people is not only objectivity, but we have to praise the attitude of subjectivity. Um, the idea that we co-create each one of our experiences, um, it's, it's John Dewey's idea that to optimize our performance, we need to advantageously modify the objects of your experience, right? So in other words, the best you can do in my talk today is not get the written transcript, the whole thing, as it actually was. Instead, it's the pearl that is provoked in your head. And you co-created that, right? You, that's advantageously modifying experience. Excuse me? questions afterwards, after my talk and the next talk. And, and hopefully that will be this really, really rich um, um, mixture. Okay, so, so that's the modification I would do. Um, too much emphasis on objectivity. Uh, we need more emphasis on subjectivity. And the other, I'll add two more attitudes. The first attitude would be an attitude of process philosophy. And that is seeing everything as a process rather than a thing. Cardinal John Henry Newman put it this way, to live is to change, and to be perfect is to have changed often. In other words, by, by um, embracing a, an attitude of process philosophy, you're very receptive to change, flux, and you're not looking for permanence. Research is a process, not a thing. We should remind ourselves of that, and really, never write the word research, but just call it researching. And that will remind us that it's a process. You are a process, not a thing, right? You're constantly in a state of unfinishedness. The poet Mary Oliver put it this way, for what is life but reaching for an answer, and what is death but a refusal to grow? That's process philosophy. Uh, I wrote this, like prize fighters, we're flexing our unfinishedness in the ring of process, seeing meaning and truth as unfixed. Meaning as relational possibilities, truth as future usefulness, right? If you think of meaning, and this is John Dewey's definition of meaning, as relational possibilities, that helps you see that the meaning of our session today will not be determined today. It's the relation of possibilities moving forward, right? That's, that's embracing process philosophy. And, and the Jamesian concept of truth is truth as future usefulness. And here's the quote by James. The truth of an idea is not a stagnant property inherent in it. Truth happens to an idea. Its verity is, in fact, a process. So you see both truth and meaning as process and futuristic. So the second attitude I would add, it pertains to language and the importance of language because that was missing from our list in the 1970 textbook. Language is not just an instrument but an environment, how one chooses to live. I tell my students the way you choose to use language is the way you choose to live. The general semanticist Wendell Johnson put it this way, we see with our categories, right? And categories are words. The, the term I've coined is linguistic readiness. We need tech readiness, but we need linguistic readiness. That means we need to prepare people to be able to exercise precision with language and understand the power of language. 
how you're doing is linguistic readiness an attitude that is already deep-seated in people's minds and in educational processes? Not really. Here's uh, Italo Carvino's assessment <laughs> called The Pestilence and Plague. Um, his quote is, uh, it sometimes seems to me that a pestilence has struck the human race in its most distinctive faculty, that is, the use of words. It is a plague afflicting language, revealing itself as a loss of cognition and intimacy, an automatism that tends to level out all expression into the most generic, anonymous, and abstract formulas to dilute meanings, to blunt the edge of expressiveness, extinguishing the spark that shoots out from the collision of words and new circumstances, right? And remember, in Najib's paper yesterday, he was citing Ortega's, I am I and my circumstances, right? So I is you and your words and your encounter with your new circumstances. All right, that's Camino T.S. Eliot put it this way. This is how difficult it is. Trying to learn to use words in every attempt is a wholly new start and a different kind of failure. Each time we start to use words, we fail, we fall short. Because one has only learned to get the better of words for the thing one no longer has to say. Right? Or the way in which one is no longer disposed to say it. And so each venture is a new beginning, only its so-called raid on the inarticulate. So I think we walk around feeling quite articulate, but in reality, at each step of the way, we're showing that we're far from it. I would say that our words are our starting points, and these are the starting points for our thinking, our present practice, our future inquiry. That means it's vitally important. So, where's your starting point? Is the world flat or round? What about leukemia? Are there, is there one type of leukemia or 15 types of leukemia? So, if your starting point is one form of leukemia, I doubt if you're positioned, well positioned, to discover that 16th form of leukemia. But if your starting point is that there's 15, I bet you're better positioned to say, I bet there's at least one more out there that we need to discover. And as far as we, we do work on ovaries and longevity, are ovaries reproductive units or are they endocrine organs that could have system-wide effects on longevity? Well, of course, they're both. Again, as I said before, we have a responsibility. And the responsibility is ours to accurately pass on to the next generation what we really know and what we have yet to understand. And without focus on language and its careful usage, we're at great risk of passing nonsense on to the next. And hence, what we really need to focus on is this attitude of exactitude with language. And I would go so far as to say, we really need to develop the vocabulary for description of self and world. And this is describing your moving self in changing world. And I'm going to return to the importance of exactitude with language toward the end of the talk. But first, a mini diversion. A mini diversion based upon yesterday's discussion of this seemingly simple question, what is education? Um, I thought I would share some perspectives. Uh, this is very similar to the Einstein quote we encountered. This is from the sage Mark Twain. Education consists mainly in what we have unlearned. Um, Charles Cowell, I don't know if you know Charles Cowell. Charles Cowell, um, his heyday was in the 1960s, 1970s in physical education, education. And he wrote that life itself means process, movement, a continual change. What we really want in education is not adjustment, but adjustability. Wow, that really struck me as profound. Cal's adjustment is like this. Through language, we grow into conformity. We learn to perceive the world as others do. We give students facts so they can believe as we do. That's sometimes called indoctrination. But Cal would call that adjustment. What we need in education is adjustability to give students or develop in students this ability so that they can reshape their beliefs 
based upon new information. Another idea, uh, another way of looking at education is, this is from Neil Postman. Does anybody know Neil Postman? Uh, did work in, in the field of media ecology. And this is a concept of education as counterbalance. So there is no best educational method or instruction. It's to counterbalance however else young people are receiving their information. So for example, if young people are bombarded by television, ads that show simple questions, simple problems that can be resolved in 30 seconds by changing the beer you drink or the shaving cream you use, then education has to counterbalance that with more complex questions and show, show young people that problems don't go away and they're not always solved in 45 seconds. Dr. Bani from Hungary uh, tomorrow is going to be speaking about hyperattention and it sounds like counterbalance to me. What is the counterbalance to hyperattention? And maybe that's the uh, key to new ideas in, uh, in uh, pedagogy. Um, I mentioned yesterday in our discussion this idea that education should focus on a iterative, successive uh, introduction to students of disorientation and reorientation, right? Because this models the creative life rather than just bombarding them with facts. And I also alluded to this earlier in the talk. I think that the goal of education might well be to develop a rich vocabulary of self-description. If you're going to sell shoes, you need a lot of shoe words. If you're going to be an astronomer, you need a lot of star words. If you're going to be a discoverer, you need words like paradox, uncertainty, open-mindedness, and so forth. So how easy, how easy is it going to be, this mastering precision with language, well, this guy, does anybody uh, know the work of I.A. Richards? I.A. Richards was, uh, they say he was in the 1930s, 1940s, and he's, he did more work on the ambiguity of language than anybody. Um, in fact, he, he said the ambiguity in language is so important, and ambiguity kind of has a negative connotation to it. He'd come up with a new term, and he called it the resourcefulness of words instead of ambiguity. And Richards tells us something very intriguing about the ambiguity of language, and it's this. The most ambiguous words are the most important ones in our language. And I recall our discussion yesterday talking about different words in different terms. We were talking about important words, and therefore they were ambiguous. And Richards went so far as to come up with his list of the 103 most important words in the English language. And if you take a look at these, you have words like change, and art, and belief, and science, and seeing, and quality, and question, and so forth. And remember, what Richards would tell you is, these are the most ambiguous words in our language. So now, it's no one's fault. It's a sign of their importance. But we need to have the awareness that this is going on. And it's interesting because the other words roundabout in the neighboring sentences are ready to shift their meanings, to conform with the meanings of the most important words. So once you try to squeeze out the ambiguity of the most important words, then the other words line up, and then hopefully you're able to communicate your meaning. Okay, so but our challenges and our difficulties are not limited to uh, language. They go beyond language um, to how well we see. In other words, can we get the best bits of information from each encounter, this is what I would call perceptual acumen. Well, the difficulty is this, our sense apparatus is not constituted to embrace the whole of reality. So, in each encounter, what we're attempting to do is master the art of abstracting. So right now, I can't take in everything in this experience. 
Right now, I'm ignoring the light from the chandeliers and so forth because I'm focusing on you. I'm abstracting my experience. And that's what we do in each and every encounter. We get fragments, not the whole picture. Moreover, the fragments that we get are then filtered through self and through culture. Wow. So, how accurate a representation are we getting from each one of our experiences? This is the idea so eloquently stated by the writer Italo Calvino, is what you see always behind you. In other words, each experience is filtered through your past experience. The physicist David Bohm called this net presentation and needed to a poet to capture a deeper sense of the art of abstracting. And it's one of Stevens. Reality is that part of reality that impresses us. Right? So we're getting pieces, we're getting fragments. So hopefully, through, through developing a method, we can correct these surface impressions. But regardless, nature escapes. And here's Andre Moreau from the Illusions of Science. We do not believe that the world will be governed by our science. We do not believe that we shall ever discover nature's last secret. We believe that any such last secret is the supreme illusion. I would argue that we need to develop our dialogic self-awareness so that we can squeeze out at least some of the deleterious illusions while preserving imaginings that foster performance. Because we, we can't squeeze out all of the imaginings. So, when we turn our attention to language, one of the things that uh, you've probably overlooked is this, and that's the power of neologism. In other words, creating new words. The new circumstances under which we are placed call for new words, new phrases, and for the transfer of old words to new objects, necessity obliges us to neologize, right? Create new words. Does that sound like a fair assessment? Thomas Jefferson said that 200 years ago. He was the first to use the term neologize. So if we train ourselves in unique ways, why would we think, and we're studying unique problems, why would we think that the language of somebody else, the words of somebody else, would adequately express us in the process? Um, neologism gives you ownership. I think that's important. Um, we do work on the trace mineral selenium as a prostate cancer preventive agent, and the conventional wisdom says selenium protects you from prostate cancer because it's an antioxidant. We have data to suggest otherwise, that what selenium does is actually preferentially sweeps away the most damaged cells. Not protecting you from damage, but optimizing your response to damage. That's probably how an organism works best. So we had to come up with a new term, so we introduced the neologism homeostatic house cleaning to the scientific literature. In other words, the preferential sweeping away of the most damaged cells. Um, Grandin referred to yesterday this idea that I, in a, in a paper written in Informing Science, I said that what is a scientific manuscript but a view formed under special circumstances, right? You, you pick the study population, you pick the parameters you measured, the dose of things that you used, and so the neologism for us is view fusk, a view formed under special circumstances. So if our goal is to optimize our response to new information, then we need a method. We can't leave this to chance. And I think we need a method that's dialogic because dialogue encompasses the back and forth process by which human potential is advanced. And that's why in the Informing Science article that I published, I talked about this idea of dialogic self-awareness. And this is the idea that the three aspects of this is develop your perceptual acumen, in other words, your ability to get the most important bits out of each encounter, 
Then conceptual acumen, that's talking to yourself and forming rich mental models. And then finally, the art of framing. You understand this much, but now you articulate your stance. Notice that all three of these are language driven. All three of them are language driven. All three of them are dialogic. Here, you're dialoguing with nature or other. Here, you're dialoguing with self. And here, you're dialoguing with an audience. And, not pictured here, but there are these feedback loops that inform this. So I promised before I wrapped up that I would return to the importance of linguistic precision, and I'm doing that now. And I, I'll state here that the gift we get from linguistic precision is greatness, which hinges on failure. And this is an idea that's come to me. I've not published it. It's called, I call it the failure hinge. And I'm going to show it to you today and see what you think. It starts out with, if we can embrace the attitude of exactitude with language, we should, we should strive for precision with language. What comes along for the ride is paradoxical, and that is an appreciation that everything is uncertain. It's Galileo's, because I study comets so carefully, I have very little I can say about them, right? The closer you look, the less certain things become. Okay, so now you become more comfortable with uncertainty. Um, Michael Gelb has used the term sfumato, which is Italian for up in smoke, this idea to be comfortable with paradox and uncertainty. But if you're comfortable with uncertainty, then that moves you into a comfort and with this attitude of process philosophy, because you see things as uncertain, unfinished, you're exploring. And so now you're comfortable with process philosophy. Now what does that bring you? That means the process brings joy, not the product. And that means you're intrinsically motivated. And if you're intrinsically motivated, then this is the cool part. Failure becomes your friend. If you're intrinsically motivated, you see failure as your richest learning experience. If you're extrinsically motivated, failure can be devastating. And if you are willing to fail, then you can achieve greatness. So, an attitude of exactitude with language can potentially bring you this shopping bag full of attitudes. Comfort with uncertainty, a process philosophy, intrinsic motivation, failure as your best friend, and achieving greatness. All, all sprouted from precision with language. Okay, so I'll make a final synthesis here. If your concerns for the next generation are uninspired, stay right where you are. Um, here is the full quote from Norman Cousins. If our purposes are frail, if the value we attach to the idea of progress is small, if our concerns for the next generation are uninspired, then we can bow low before the difficulty, stay as we are, and accept the consequences of drift. In the health field, um, the CEO of Eli Lilly said it differently, the patient is waiting. We need to get our A game on. The patient's waiting. We need to function at a high level. Um, we entertain some ideas about what are the goals of education, and here's mine, if I could capture it in a sentence. Education should focus less on giving young people confidence in their beliefs and more on developing the confidence to reshape their next set of beliefs in response to new information. It sounds a lot like Calo's adjustability. To reach out for potential, we're going to need tools. Um, I like what physicist Freeman Dyson said about tools. He framed it this way. Science is an art form and not a philosophical method. The great advances in science usually result from new tools rather than from new doctrines. Science flourishes best when it uses freely all the tools at hand 
unconstrained by preconceived notions of what science ought to be. And every time we introduce a new tool, it always leads to new and unexpected discoveries because nature's imagination is always greater than our own. Right, we need to be on our A game. Um, in my research, the new tools we're exploring is this extreme natural biology, studying these oldest living dogs in the United States, equivalent to 100-year-old people, and, and trying to understand, get clues to what it takes to age successfully and be resistant to cancer. I said before, for progress, we need tech readiness, but we also need the counterbalance, and that's linguistic readiness, and I don't think we're getting that. Educational psychologist Jerome Bruner put it this way, language is our greatest intellectual appendage, and we seem to be ignoring it, at least in science education. How will we measure greatness of our efforts? I believe it will be this way. It will be the responses we awaken, and that will be the, our own responses, responses in self, and the responses in others. We need to sharpen our angles of vision, and we need to see whatever method you develop as a set of guiding attitudes for pursuit of the mysteries that nourish us as our journey deepens. And I tried to capture this in, in one slide, and, and I, I didn't have time to show you the many attitudes that I think are critical, but there are three what I would call meta-attitudes. You need a method that's dialogic. This, this will enable you to function at a high level in this art of abstracting, and it's Ortega's I am I and my circumstances. You're constantly interacting with your environment, your circumstances. You need a new map of the territory, specifically a, a, a balance what I would call U-shaped thinking. In other words, good things. You get rid of either one that's good or bad because that doesn't make very much sense. You think continuum. Um, and um, this is Buber's uh, balance on the narrow ridge. And then the third is sensibility for the unfinished. And that's this idea of process philosophy. You celebrate your unfinishedness, both truth and meaning. The meaning of things has a futuristic component to a process-related component. Um, this is the dialogic self-awareness I was talking about. But what this brings to you are two important things. A life that's rich in relational possibilities, in other words, meaning. But also, it generates in you a rich repertoire of responses. That's the moves you'll make. That's the, that's the actions that you'll take. These other key attitudes that I didn't get a chance to talk about that are driven by exactitude and language can convert us from discoverers. That's noble, but we need to be rediscoverers, right? We're a process. So we don't stop at being a discoverer. We're constantly rediscovering. The failure hinge that I told you about feeds that. And then, finally, we're looking for performance in two realms, aren't we? And this is Gurdjieff and his idea of the difference between reacting and doing. How we spend our lives mostly is reacting, not doing. And what makes us truly human is the doing. So in the realm of reacting, this is in our jobs, this is reacting to challenges, we need situational excellence, and that's going to bring us success in business and relationships. But we also need the doing part. When I go out and visit the oldest dogs in the United States in their homes to study aging, I'm doing. I'm doing. I'm not reacting to anything. And so there's real, that's how you find your authentic self, and that's where joy comes from, not only yourself, but also the creative products. So if we develop an um, a, um, effective method, maybe it will keep us out of trouble, that comes when we think of a life poorly spent. Here's Giancarlo Minotti says, Hell begins on the day when God grants us a clear vision of all that we might have achieved, of all the gifts which we have wasted. Uh, I would say that we, we can heed the advice of the sage of Concord, Ralph Waldo Emerson, speak what you think today with words as hard as cannonballs, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks. So to master the art of possibility, you need to speak your attitudes. And I'll end there. Thank you very much.